Hi. Today we're going to practice annotating by using a version of TPCast. I'll put a link to it in the description box below. I'll try it out on The Three Fates by Rosemary Dobson. It's an absolutely terrific poem. I found it in this year's Cambridge Lit Anthology and it's about the right level for an IB unseen paper. It's worthwhile practicing annotations for unseen poetry to prepare for the exams or even coursework essays. If you're going to use this video to revise, and I suggest you do, <laughs> then my advice is to click on the link to the poem in the description box below, copy and annotate it, and see if you can come up with your own thesis statement or introduction. Then come back and we'll go through the process together and let's see how far we agree. You can leave your thesis statement or introduction in the comments section below for feedback. Okay, let's get started and uh, happy annotating. So, you're back. The first T in TPCAS stands for the title, and that's the first thing that we've got to get to grips with. The title, The Three Fates, traditionally the fates are portrayed as spinners, each with a different task. Um, the first spins the thread of life, the second measures the length, and the third cuts it with her shears. Well, so far so good. The other thing though that you've got to understand is these goddesses were not to be trifled with. Your fate was in their hands, and they didn't take kindly to those who tried to manipulate or change their fate. Well, let's take a look at a couple of different stories just to make sure that we understand this idea. The biblical Jonah had a calling, or destiny, or fate, to go to Nineveh and tell the residents to repent their sins. Obviously, he wasn't so happy about that. And so he jumped in a boat and sailed off in the opposite direction. That boat might be a real boat, or it might be a metaphorical boat, his lifeboat, for example. Either way, a storm came and he was tossed overboard and swallowed by a big fish. Only when he gets back in line with his fate, agrees to do what he's meant to do, does he get burped back up onto the shore and he can act out his destiny. To the ancient Hebrews, it was irrelevant whether you liked your fate or not, you suffered it regardless. And then there's Oedipus. Poor Oedipus. He really got stung for trying to outrun his fate. His destiny was to kill his father and sleep with his mother. Well, you can see why he wasn't too keen about that. And to be truthful, the parents weren't that happy either. Uh, and so they gave baby Oedipus away to be brought up by step-parents. Unfortunately, Oedipus thought that the step-parents were his real parents, and so when he heard of his fate, he ran in the opposite direction. A long route, killing an old man, and then marrying an older woman. Yeah, yeah, you can guess who they were and how the story works out. Avoiding your fate is not an option. Yeah, that's you I'm looking at, Oedipus. Dry your eyes. So that's the ancient Hebrews and the Greeks for you. Let's do one more. The Romans were no less unequivocal about it. Ted Hughes opens Actian in his Tales from Ovid with Destiny, not Guilt, was enough for Actian. Destiny or Fate drives him to the cavern where he sees the virgin goddess Diana bathing naked. He pays for that indiscretion with his life. Diana turns him into a stag and has his own hounds hunt him down. They tear him limb from limb and eat his flesh. <sniffs> Yummy. <laughs> All the while his friends are calling out his name. Actian! Actian! Come and see the last kill of the day. However they say that in line. Little do they know he is the last kill of the day. You get the idea. The three sisters rarely smiled kindly on those who were trying to avoid their fate. So once we understand the characters referenced in the title, it's easy to predict how the protagonist's invocation at the start of this poem is going to work out. This is one of those great circular poems. It's a bit like Pink Floyd's The Wall, if you're of that age. That album ends, isn't this where? And then it begins, we come in. And this is where we come in. At the moment of drowning, he invoked the three sisters. So invoked means to call out in prayer, prayer or supplication, and we told what he calls out for, life ever, everlasting. 
We know what the sisters' attitude is to those who try to avoid their fate, and so it's no surprise to learn it was a mistake. Dobson also uses the word aberration to drive the point home. An aberration is something unnatural, and it's certainly unnatural to call out for life everlasting, and unnatural to hope the mercy from, for mercy from the three fates. So verse 1 introduces a scene. A drowning man crying out to the fates to be spared death. This inciting incident is told simply as a statement of fact, in the past tense, with minimal information. Verse 2 begins, he came up like a cork. It appears his wish has been granted. He bobs back to the surface and back to the river bank. The key word here is back, and that is now the direction of his life. He puts his clothes on in reverse order and returns to the house. Other than travelling back in time, the true nature of his punishment is as yet undisclosed. To an extent, we're also thrown off the scent as he dresses in reverse order. If this is a suicide attempt, which we can infer it is from the later verses, then who gets undressed for suicide? Everybody commits suicide fully clothed, jumping into the river. So it's not necessarily certain. It's part of the ambiguity of the poems. That's one of the things that I really like. There's so much minimal in, uh, information given that our deductions remain possibilities, not certainties. Verse 3 tells us he suffered the enormous agonies of passion. He's living his life backwards, so he feels the pain before we know the cause. Whatever drove him to write poetry, or rather in this case, unwrite poetry, is as yet unknown to us. Similarly, the actions of brushing away tears seem to cause him to fall and bring on his sadness. By granting his wish for life everlasting, the fates have ironically punished him. They have condemned him to relive his agonies in perpetuity. The clue to the cause of his suffering comes in the fourth verse. A girl. Well, how predictable is that? He loves her wildly. The adverb wildly suggests his emotions are out of control. Um, and the idea here is he's controlled by his passions rather than the other way round. So if you've read Ovid's Metamorphoses, you'll know it's not going to turn out well for him. And instead of them growing old together, as perhaps he'd hoped for, he now watches her grow younger. The verb watches infers his love was unspoken, unrequited. He stares at her over the garden fence and she sits on her swing but does not communicate her passion to her. He doesn't communicate his passion to her. Dobson also uses the phrase, as the day regressed towards morning. And in the final verse, the narrator says, when she was gone, and the house, and the swing, and daylight, it sounds as if the protagonist is reliving his experience all in one day. There's a certain amount of ambiguity here, though. Um, but the final, but it fits with the final interpretation, or it fits with the final image, with the real unrolling towards the river. His life now plays like a film on fast forward, or actually fast reverse. And in this point, there's an instant pause, and then we're taking back to the beginning, back to the river, back to the point where we come in. He's about to invoke the fates and relive the whole drama again, and again, and again. There's one other thing. As with the possibility of suicide, it's difficult to be certain about the age difference between the protagonist and the girl. She appears young, too young. But as we're not given her age and we're not certain how quickly time regresses, it's difficult to be certain of the age gap. This is a great point. It's simple and tricky at the same time. Each verse, each tercer, offers a singular image that drives the story forwards, or backwards in this case, what makes it tricky, however, is not just that the plot is told in reverse order, but that there are so few details we have to work hard to infer the motives of the protagonist. Was it a suicide attempt in the river? Was she just a child, a Lolita to his humbert humbert? To do so, though, it's well worth the effort. To wrap this up, I put it into a thesis statement that looks something like this. In this poem, Dobson has the three fates grant a drowning man's wish for eternal life. An ironic punishment as the protagonist must now perpetually relive his unrequited love, his emotional torment and his possible failed suicide. Dobson's poem is a reworking of the old adage, be careful what you wish for. Well, I hope you found that useful. 
If you have a different interpretation, leave it in the comment box below. Ta-ta for now. This is Think Think Think. No, it's not. It's Think Think Ink. <laughs> Thanking you.